good morning again, and welcome to Redemption Hill. My name is Tim. I am one of the pastors here. Uh, we are in the middle of an ongoing series in the Gospel of Luke. We are currently in Luke chapter 8, and uh, Jesus has been teaching to a large crowd and then teaching his disciples. And, and last week, we looked at the parable of the sower and the seeds, and uh, in that uh, parable, um, right after that, Jesus explains the purpose of the parables to his disciples. Pastor Raven uh, helped us see that, that there are different responses to hearing God's word, and we need to be aware of those, and we need to uh, realize that God is in control, that God is, is sovereign over what happens when his word is, is preached. And the parable of the sower um, uh, leads directly into this passage today, uh, which begins with another parable. The parable of the lamb. And, and, and it especially leads to this a very important statement. Um, the first statement that Jesus kind of makes as a clear, here's what you need to do. Um, it's, uh, verse 18 of chapter 8, he just says these, these simple words, be careful how you hear. This seems to be the main point of, of what Jesus is trying to show us, trying to tell us with these parables. Uh, it is the point that, that Jesus will kind of hammer home in the verses that we will look at uh, next week. Be careful how you hear. Take care how you listen. The kind of listener you are, the kind of hearer that you are when it comes to, to, to God and his word, um, it helps us see where we, are, where we are at in relation to God. It helps us see clearly where we are in relation to him. These verses help us see clearly that while it is absolutely true that God is in control of our hearts, God is in control of salvation, we also see that it is absolutely true that we have been given a responsibility. We will see that we have a very specific work, a very specific response to the work that God is doing. We are active in this. We have a part to play in hearing the word of God and then sharing that word with others. So let's read this together. This is Luke chapter 8, verses 16 through 18. Luke 8, 16 through 18. Jesus says this. No one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care then how you hear, for to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you uh, for how it uh, shapes, informs, transforms our lives. Father, we, we want to hear from you today. So we, we ask you to speak, speak to our hearts, even as we listen to these words, uh, take them and apply them to our lives. Um, help us to remember these things. Um, let these things take root inside of us and, and change our lives to, to make us the light that you have made us so that we can shine your light uh, to a lost and dying world. Father, we need you for all of this. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, look again at verse uh, 16, just the very first statement he says, no one after lighting a lamp. So, so we're going to just stop right there because uh, the, these, are, these are parables and it's important to understand them. Um, and so we need to know what does Jesus mean by lighting a lamp? We can just take those things for granted sometimes. He's just told the, the parables of the sower and the seeds and talked about what good soil looks like in our hearts. And so Jesus is saying that, that for those who are good soil, people who hear God's word, they receive it and they follow it, those people have become lamps. They have become lights that, that Jesus is going to use to shine through the darkness. In other words, the word of God is, is, is not just given to us so that we will know things that other people don't know. We don't come to hear God's word each and every week just to politely agree with what is said. We don't come and hear God's word simply to gain good moral knowledge. We aren't supposed to become prideful that we have knowledge that others don't have. 
when, when, when we receive God's word, a light is lit up inside of us. And it changes the way we live. It changes the way we live to transform our lives so that our lives and the word of God start to match up. We start to look more like Jesus. And our lives begin to shine as lights to a dark world. Matthew 5, Jesus gives this same parable. But, but at the end of that, that parable, he says this, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The things that we do and say change. The way that we talk, the way that we act changes. Our desires change. Our innermost being changes. We begin to want to glorify God in all that we do. We want others to join in with that. We want others to glorify God as well. Our lives are supposed to change when we hear the word of God. We mature, we grow, we become more like Jesus. We need to let God's word take hold of our lives in such a way that people see the difference. We, they, they see that it changes who we are. It changes the way we talk. It changes the things that we talk about. It changes the way that we care about others. It all changes. And so God puts his light in us. And then the rest of verse 16, Jesus says, No one after lighting the lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Another version says, So that anyone that enters may see the light. This lighting of a lamp, it is, it is God's word taking root and transforming the way that you think, the way that you speak, the way that you live. And you are meant to let God's work in you be seen by everyone that comes into your life. Not to draw attention to yourself, but to point to the true light of Jesus. No one covers that lamp or puts it in a place where it can't be seen. Jesus has just told his 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 followers, that he speaks in parables and that some people don't understand it. And immediately he follows it up with another parable, a parable that is so simple that seemingly every child and every adult should be able to understand. If you have a lamp, don't cover it up. Don't hide it. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. You use items for their intended purpose. I had a roommate in, in college. We rented a house together, and, and one day I walked into his room, and he had several sets of skis in, in, in his room. And so I just naturally said, I didn't, I didn't know that you skied, uh, to which he replied, I don't. Uh, and so naturally, I looked at him and said, Joe, then why do you have so many skis in here? And he looked at me and said, I saw them, and I just thought, just in case. <laughs> I still don't know just in case of what. Um, he had never gone skiing before then, and, and it's been 30 years, and I don't think he's gone skiing since. You don't buy skis just in case. You buy them to go ski. You don't invite people to your house, make appetizers, make a meal, make a dessert, and then just throw it in the trash right before they come over. You make a meal to, to enjoy it, to, to, for those that are coming into your house, for them to enjoy it. You use items for their intended purpose. When we lose power in a storm, we, we, we find a lamp or a flashlight and we set it in the middle of the room so that everyone in our home can benefit from that light. At this time, when it, when it became dark, they found a lamp, they put it in the middle of the room so that everyone who came into that, at that house could benefit from the light. When the light of God's word takes hold of you, then you let that light shine so that everyone who comes into your life can benefit from it. Lamps are meant to give light to the space they are in. And if you cover it up, if you hide it, if you turn it off, then you are, you are working against the very purpose of that light. Jesus says, you take that lamp and you put it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. The light is meant to benefit anyone that would enter the room. We don't pick and choose who gets to experience the light. If, if, if we have experienced the grace of God, it is because of Jesus. It is because he did not hide the light from us. He has not hidden his life, 
light, even facing the pain of death and a grave. He let his light shine and we get to live because of that. We have life because of that. We shouldn't hide it from some and display it for others. That's what we often do. God produces his light inside of us. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. And yet, we often keep this light hidden. We cover it from people that meet, need it the most. Jesus knows this, and he is very gracious and patient, but he tells us this shouldn't be that way. I want you to know I'm preaching to my own heart this morning when it comes to sharing God's word with, with those that need it, that those who haven't trusted in him, that those that don't believe I've often failed. I've let fear or desire to please others too often keep me from sharing the gospel from those who need it. I feel like I can easily talk with other Christians about what I'm learning from God's word, the impact it's having on my life. But when I'm around those who are not Christian, it becomes so easy. All of a sudden, it becomes so easy to find other things to talk about. We can convince ourselves we just don't want to be a jerk. We don't want to offend. God's word is sometimes offensive. We're talking about a light to darkness. There are people that don't want to hear this. Not sharing God's word with others is like turning the lights off when someone comes in the room so that we can be more relatable to them in the dark. We turn the lights off so that people think we are in the dark with them because we are afraid that the light is offensive. There are people in your life that don't want to hear about this. There are people in, in your life that don't want to hear that they're in darkness and they don't want to see or hear about the light. Your family, your friends, co-workers, neighbors, roommates, many of them don't want to hear about Jesus, but they desperately need him. They don't want to hear you share more of what God has done in your life, how God has changed your life. They don't want to hear of the hope that is inside you, but it is that hope that they are in desperate need of. There's always a good reason that seems to come up to not share the gospel with someone. The enemy can provide lots of good reasons to keep God's light hidden. But brothers and sisters, when we receive God's word, we should be excited to share that with others. If you are a Christian, God has made you a light to this dark world. It's already happened. You are the light of the world. So let's shine like we are the light of the world. I know things can get away from us easily, and, 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 and I'm not at the end of the sermon. Um, I've been preaching for 10 minutes, so don't think I am. But I don't want this to get away from us today. So, so we're going to take 20 seconds right now. And I, just where you're at right now, if you are a Christian, I want you to think of someone. Someone that needs Jesus, and I, and, and I want you to pray for them. And I want you to ask God to give you the courage to share what he's done in your life, to share your testimony, to share the gospel with them. I want you to think of somebody, picture them, and I want you to ask God to work in their life and to give you the courage to share with them. Take a few minutes, to, a few moments, and just pray for them. Um, we'll all kind of pray together. Father, you know every life, every face that we have in mind right now. Father, we need, we need courage and boldness from you to be able to share these things with those that have not trusted in you. I pray that you would do a mighty work in their life, that you would prepare their hearts to hear, and that as we share with them that, um, that you would be at work in saving them, Father that we can just rejoice in the work that you were doing. Um, thank you, and we trust you with it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Nobody in whom God has lit the light is going to want to conceal that and cover it up. Jesus has changed your life, and he's making you more like him. We do not keep that hidden. 
We will need to be open and honest about the work of Jesus, about the truth of God's word. Jesus is going to use his word and his light to encourage Christians and to save sinners. That is an amazing gift. With, with our fellow Christians, when we share God's word and God's work with them, we get to encourage them. We get to help them grow and mature. We get to strengthen our brothers and sisters every time we share God's word with them. And with non-Christians, when you share the light with them, you play a part in proclaiming the hope that we have in Jesus. You play a part in God saving people from their sins. What a privilege. So we are to let that shine, light shine to anyone who would enter our lives. And then Jesus encourages us to let this light take, take hold of our entire lives. Not just our outward lives, but not just our outward works. God's word will bring everything into the light and we should let his word have its perfect work in us. Verse 17, Luke chapter 8. Jesus tells us, for nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. I want you to know there's, there's some options here on what exactly Jesus intended to say in this. What does this verse actually mean? And, and commentators and pastors come up with basically two things, and, and, and both of them are really good. And, and, and so I want you to know that they're both good and helpful. Some commentators believe that this is a reference specifically to the gospel and God's truth and that everything will come to light and that everyone will know that God's truth is truth. And that is absolutely true. The other option is that Jesus is, is talking to his disciples. He's talking to Christians and he's telling them to let the light do its work in them completely. That every part of their life should be brought into the light. I think this is what Jesus is getting at here. Jesus is saying, whatever, whatever remnants of darkness remains in your life, whatever sin, secrecy, shame, whatever you think is hidden, let the light transform it. If you're trying hard to, to keep it hidden so that no one will, will see how sinful you, you truly are, then you can stop. Jesus already knows all of it. Jesus knew what he was going to the cross for. He isn't surprised by your sin. He was going to save you from your sins. He knows how sinful you truly are. You're not going to be able to keep it hidden. It is already known. So now, today, bring it to the light. Jesus is leading us to let his word have its complete and total work in our lives. No part of our lives should be left untouched. We don't show the good works that God has produced in us while covering up all the hidden sin that we're holding on to. We don't, we don't proclaim his good news and his gospel while hiding all the deep, dark things that we don't want to let go of. That is not living in the light. We can let God's word and his work have complete control over all of our lives, all of our thoughts, all of our actions. Here's why I think this is what Jesus is saying. He uses almost these, these exact same words again just a few chapters later in Luke chapter 12. In this passage, Jesus is warning about the Pharisees. He is warning about hypocrisy. He's warning about the, the religious hypocrites. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 12, he says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And then in verse 2, Jesus says, Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Those are the same words. It's almost the exact same words in Luke 12. But here he is being more explicit. I am not raising up an army of hypocrites. Don't be hypocritical. Beware of being hypocritical. All the stuff you want to keep hidden and private, I, I died for that too. It will be brought into the light, so go ahead and bring it into the light now. The truth is, for those who have, who have experienced the mercy and forgiveness of Jesus, we should welcome this. We should ultimately love that all of our sins 
all of our weaknesses, all of our failures can safely be brought into the light. Our worst thoughts, the worst things that we've done can all be known. And yet, because of Jesus, you are still loved. You are still treasured. You are forgiven. That is the gift of God. The Bible is is such a testimony to this. I've I've often said if they were going to be going to have a museum of sin, uh, which my wife always reminds me is a horrible idea for a museum. Uh, But if there was a museum of sin, David from the Bible would have his own wing of the museum. He is he is beloved for his psalms, but he is just as well known for the many sins he committed. For how bad those sins were. Peter, who is the most famous probably of Jesus' apostles, was consistently saying and doing the wrong things. He failed Jesus at the most important times of his ministry. Another of Jesus' apostles, Thomas, would become historically known as Doubting Thomas. Can you imagine if everyone in your church and other churches just refer to you as Doubting Eric? No. Doubting Tim. That's what most people know about Thomas. But Thomas did ultimately believe. And is, is in eternity with Jesus. And I can assure you that he doesn't have a problem with the Bible showing that he is one who doubted. None of these men would have an issue with their sin, their unbelief being displayed, being brought into the light. Because all of it points to the power of God in Christ and to salvation. It was Jesus who helped Thomas in his doubting. It was the Holy Spirit that filled Peter. And it was Jesus that used Peter to build his church. It was Jesus that that, that saved David. It was Jesus that paid the penalty for all of David's sin. These three men had, had enough sin to fill a museum. But God's grace is greater than all of their sin. All of their sin ultimately points to God's plan of redemption and sending Jesus into this world to save sinners from their sins and the work that he can do, that he alone can do. They might have been ashamed of it at the time, but now they see that God has recorded these stories for us to read, not to shame them, but to remind uh, all of us of God's grace and power, to remind us that we can't put our hope in, in heroes, in, in men or women, our only hope is in Jesus. Amen. There is nothing that will be kept secret. There is nothing the light will not expose. So go ahead today and let the light be at work in your life. Confess your sins. Repent of your sins. Jesus already knows all of it. We can quit acting like we can cover it all up. Quit trying to make ourselves look better than we are. We can let it come to the light because when it's brought into the light, it no longer has a hold on you. So we let people know. We confess our sins to one another. Talk to your community group. Talk to those close to you. Confess your sins. And when we do, we receive help from our brothers and sisters in the church. Let every aspect of your life, every single aspect of your life be transformed by the light of Jesus. Christ died for all of your sins, all of your failures. You are safe and secure, so live in the light. Jesus then comes to what appears to be his main point, his main instruction for us today. This is verse 18. He says, take care then how you hear. He doesn't say specifically right here, take care then how you live. He doesn't talk about all the different works that you need to do. He follows all this up with take care how you hear. I think for many Christians and churches, we tend to think that we are better hearers than better listeners than we truly are. We think if we read our Bible sometimes and if we go to church consistently, then that makes us good hearers of God's word. I've shared this before. Um, Our daughter is about to turn eight, so she is old enough that she has certain chores and jobs to do at home. And and we remind uh, Clementine of those things. And she's gotten into a habit the last year or so. Um, When we remind her, she just says, got it, and gives us a thumbs up, and then runs away really fast. Um, 
it's very cute, but it, it, like 90% of the time, she does not, in fact, got it. Um, and, and so one of her main jobs is that when she gets home from school, she needs to go outside and play with the dog. Before she gets a snack, before she starts playing, she take the dog outside and play with wear him out. And so one day I reminded her, you, you need to take the dog outside. You, you, you need, I took her through all the steps. Here's what you need to follow. And, and as I'm talking, I, I can tell that she is looking around, that she is doing everything else. But as I, as I finish, she quickly replies, got it. Um, <laughs> and she heads downstairs to take the dog outside. And two minutes later, the dog is upstairs looking at me like, it didn't work. Like, <laughs> we're, clearly, I'm not outside. She's not outside. So I go downstairs, and she's down there. And in those two minutes, she's taking every toy out possible, playing with it. And so I, I gently, gently ask her, Clementine, what, what are you supposed to be doing right now? And she stares at me for like 10 minutes. Uh, until I say, take the dog, and she goes, oh, got it. And it gives me a thumbs up. And now, now this is the same job she's supposed to do every day. It's not a hard rule to follow, and yet she ends up doing everything but what we ask. This is, this is like you and I with the Bible. We, we read our Bibles in the morning. We hear what we're supposed to do. We hear sermons on God's Word, and in our minds, we're like, got it. Oh. <laughs> And then a few hours later, we've forgotten all that we read, all that we heard. It has no impact on our life whatsoever. When you go to a concert or a sporting event, when you travel to a national park, you will talk about it for days, months, maybe years, telling everyone what an incredible experience it was. You were excited to, to relive and to share all the details of this great experience. And that's a good thing. But when we come on Sunday morning, even if you just heard the best sermon of your life, it just takes the kids going crazy in the back, it just takes somebody cutting you off on the road, and you immediately have, have lost everything that happened that morning. There's a reason. It's, we have to pay careful attention to how we hear. And, and let me just say, there is an enemy at work that doesn't want you to hear well. That enemy doesn't care if you tell everybody in the world how incredible that concert was. But the enemy doesn't want God's word to take hold of your heart, and he definitely doesn't want you to spread God's word. So we must pay special care to how we hear. Take care then how you hear. You are an active participant. When you come on Sunday morning, whether you are, you are preaching or not, you have a part to play each and every Sunday. You have a part to play every time you read God's word. Take care. Take care how you hear. Prepare your ears. Prepare your heart. When you come on Sunday morning, come prepared. Come expecting to hear the word of God. Come prepared to, see, to receive God's word and respond to it. Come prepared to let, that, let his word take hold of you. You don't come every Sunday morning just to hear the opinions of someone you already agree with. You don't need to come and hear the opinions of, of us that are, that are preaching. If you're coming to just hear opinions, you're going to get tired of it real fast. I've got three strong opinions about things. Tom Cruise is the greatest actor of all time. <laughs> pizza Hut is legitimately good pizza. And, and, and Tom Brady is the worst thing to ever happen to sports. Um, now, now, those are really good opinions, um, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about any of those things. But when you come here on Sunday morning, you should come to hear much better things. You should come to hear about Jesus, to hear all that he has done for you, all that he is doing for you, and all that he has promised to do for you in the future. You should come to hear the words of life. You should come to hear how, how you can be made to be more like Jesus. You should come to hear how you can help others hear about Jesus. That should be the thing that gets you up on Sunday morning. You should come ready and anticipating to hear God's word proclaimed, to hear the truth of God. If God has put his light in you, then you should love and desire more of it. So be careful, pay special attention to how you hear. 
I want to encourage you to, today. I, I believe this to be true. Every Sunday can become a powerful day in your week if you know how to listen well. If you know how to listen to God's word, you can always get something out of a sermon that teaches God's word and points to Jesus. I heard one pastor put it this way, a powerful sermon has often rescued a weak listener and a good listener has often rescued a weak sermon. Now, I, I do not want you to tell me which one you think happened today, um, but you should be listening for God's word. And, and if that's what you are listening for, then every Sunday can become powerful in your life. We are told in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, we thank God continually. We, we can't stop thanking God because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. You received it not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God which is at work in you who believe. The word of God is at work in those who believe. God's word is at work in you, so you should be excited to hear it and receive it. It is not our words, it is God's word that brings, brings life, brings hope. So we pay special attention to how we hear God's word. Now, how do we, how do, we do this? As we get ready to close, I want you to, to just th hear three quick ways that you can take care how you hear God's word, especially on Sunday mornings. We need this each and every day, but three ways that can help you. When you come on Sunday mornings, I encourage you, don't come expecting to be entertained and don't come only looking for words that make you feel good about yourself. The Bible refers to that as people who like to have their ears tickled. Uh, this is 2 Timothy 4, 3. It says that they will not endure sound doctrine, but, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will uh, get for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, and they will turn their ears away from the truth. We can, we can think if we go to a, a, a church that preaches the Bible, we can think that that's for everyone else. But any of us can easily be guilty of just wanting to hear things that just reaffirm us, that are just things that we want to hear. We often want to hear the good without hearing that apart from Christ, we can do nothing. We, we can easily want to hear and, and be encouraged and refreshed, but not be called out and remember that apart from Christ, we are sinners lost, that we need to change. And, and, and he promises to change us. We can only hear the parts that we want to hear. We had a really bad storm years ago and, and one of our neighbor's trees fell into the road. And, uh, and, and while the storm was still going on, he, he went out there and, and tried to, to move the tree. And so I looked outside and my wife could tell that I was gonna go help him. And, and so she said to me, you, you know, you should both wait until after the storm. You don't need to try and be a hero. But all I heard was the word hero. Uh, and, and, my, and my immediate thought was, that will be the word they use to describe me. Uh, Jen's, Jen's exactly right. Uh, I am a hero. We, we do this often with, with, with God's word. We hear the parts that we wanna hear, and ignore the rest. We should come ready to hear how much God loves us and we should come ready to hear that because of his great love, our lives need to change. We should want to hear all of, of God's truth that, that, that proclaims his graciousness and his goodness and we should want to hear that we need to leave sin behind. We should want to hear all of God's truth that leads us to become more like Jesus. God's word encourages and refreshes our soul like nothing else can. And God's word is also sharper than any two-edged sword, and it cuts us deep. We should want both of those things. When we come on Sunday, we should be ready to hear everything that leads us to be more like Christ. Second, when you come on Sunday mornings, I encourage you. Several people told me that they did this this week. But read the text beforehand. 
We're not trying to surprise you each and every week. Um, we're, we're going through Luke right now. We're going to end in verse 18 here in a moment. So guess what that means for next week? We'll be in verse 19. Um, it's pretty simple. So read the text beforehand. Consider the passage. Pray through the passage. Shelby usually sends out something on Church Center to let you know what we'll be focusing on for the songs and the sermons. So, so read through that passage and consider what it means. Talk to people about it. Consider what it means to your life. Come prepared to hear God's word. And then finally, as you come on Sunday mornings, pray. Pray before you come to church. Pray for those who are preaching that they will preach the word of God and that God will give them his words. Pray for the other members of, of the church that they would hear God's word and that it would change them. Pray for, pray for anyone that is, is not trusted in Christ who would come, that they would learn about Jesus and come to know him as Savior. Pray for, pray for our community groups, our families, our individuals as they discuss these truths throughout the week. And pray for yourself. Pray that God would give you a heart that is ready to receive these words. That, that he would transform your life. That he would give you a teachable, humble heart that is, that is ready to receive God's word. Because there is a wonderful promise for those that, that, that hear God's word. That, that, that as Christians, as believers in verse 18, we're told, for to the one who has, more will be given. As Christians, this, this should excite us. We should want more, more of Jesus, more of his word. Take care how you hear, because for all those who have the light, for all those that, that, that know Jesus, you're going to grow and you're going to mature and you're going to understand more about how great Jesus is, about how much you need him. You are going to be made more like Jesus. We should long for this. David in Psalm 19, verses 10 and 11 says this about the word of God. More to be desired are his words than gold, even fine gold, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. God's words are more to be desired than anything else in this world. The prophet Jeremiah said it this way, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. For those that have been called by his name, for those that have trusted in him, for those that God has changed your heart from hard, thorny soil into good soil, we should be excited to receive and to hear God's word. For those who have trusted in Christ as their Savior, for those that believe that Jesus gave his life to conquer the power of sin and death and now lives forever then we should long for God's word. The word of God should be the joy and the delight of our heart because it points us to Jesus. We get to be made more like Jesus and we get to share that with others. His word is a gift, a gift that is a light to a lost and dying world. So we should take care in how we hear God's, God's word. We should desire to hear him more than all the other voices in the world. We should desire to hear him more than we desire to hear our own voice. We should say with the apostles, you have the words of life. Where else are we going to go? And we should prepare ourselves each and every day to hear and to receive God's word for, for our life. And we can only do this because Jesus did not hide his light from us. He was facing death. He was facing the grave. And he did not hide his light. It is because of his good work on our behalf that we can tr truly have life. That we can live today. We can live in that light. Apart from him, there is no light. We are lost and hopeless. But in him, we have the light. That is such a beautiful and wonderful promise. And it is a warning as well. As he closes out verse 18, that for those who, who do not have, even what they think they have will be, be taken away. We, the response to that is to be careful how you hear. Listen well. We want to be those who get more of it, whose lives are changed more from it. And all we have to do is trust in God 
Believe God and listen. Listen well. Let, that, that, let God's word take hold of us and transform us. In Jesus, we find an everlasting fountain that will never dry up. And he has promised to give us exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. When we go into our days, when we show up on Sunday morning, we aren't always expecting great things, but we have a God who can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. That is a beautiful thing. More of Jesus, more of his word. That is what we should desire and long for each and every day. Uh, let's pray together. Father, we, we thank you and praise you for your goodness. Uh, we thank you um, that you sent your son into this world so that we can know what life is. Um, he came as a light into a dark world. And because of him, we can now have life. Father, remind us of that each and every day. Let that be the thing that drives us to pick up our Bibles and read it. Let that thing be the, the thing that drives us to come on Sunday morning to hear more of God's Word. Let His work in, in, in our life be the thing that motivates us to listen well, to hear well. And I pray that you would transform our lives, that you would transform the way we talk, the way we act, that you would transform the way we care about others and the way that we share these things with others. And that through that, we trust that you are going to do great and mighty things. Father, Father we need you for 